Given a signal such as a pulse like this that we've studied, we can compute for it a Fourier transform, which is going to be, uh, for example, in this case, a sync function like that. Now, uh, a Fourier transform works well when we are talking about signals which are typically time limited, such as this over here, and the area under the curve over here is bounded. Because remember, for a Fourier transform to be computed, we need to satisfy the Dirichlet conditions, which says that basically the integral from minus infinity to infinity of mod x t uh, dt is less than infinity. But what if we consider the signal that looks like that? You know, it's just, a, for example, just a constant or an exponentially rising value, which is going like that. Uh, in both of these cases, the area under the curve is going to be uh, unbounded, and so the Dirichlet condition is not satisfied. And for this reason, the Fourier transform may or may not exist. We don't really know for sure. So it's better to use, uh, in such cases, a different transform called the Laplace transform. And to understand how the Laplace transform works, let's just compare it with the Fourier transform. So first, I'll define this Fourier transform. So x of j omega, which is a Fourier transform of xt, is given by the integral minus infinity to infinity, xt e to the minus j omega t dt. And we compare this to the Laplace transform. Here we have x of s, where s is a complex quantity, is given by integral minus infinity to infinity, xt e to the minus st dt. And if you compare the two, what we're doing is we're replacing this e to the minus j omega t to the minus st, where s is given by sigma plus j omega. So what that means is that we can rewrite the Laplace transform as integral minus infinity to infinity xt times e to the minus sigma t and e to the minus j omega t dt. In other words, we can think of the function x that we had over here in the Fourier transform, and we're replacing this with this product over here, x t e to the minus sigma t. Now, why is that important? Because we realize that uh, e to the minus sigma t is just, because sigma is a real function, sigma is a real value, belongs to reals. So for this uh, sigma, it's going to be going like that. It's going to be exponentially declining. And as we get further and further away from the y-axis, it's going to get smaller and smaller exponentially fast. So intuitively, what that means is that when we take a function such as the constant function, and we're going to multiply it with this one over here, then we're going to get an exponentially declining value. Even for something which is going up exponentially fast, if you multiply it by a suitably large exponential value, it's still going to go down. And so the, the idea is that for functions which have an uh, unbounded or infinite uh, integral, absolute integral value, which is this one over here, we are going to uh, kind of dampen them down by multiplying them with the value e to the minus sigma t. And so that is basically the intuition behind the, behind the Laplace transform. It, it, it allows us to work with a broader class of functions which don't uh, satisfy the uh, directly conditions. So a critical choice is the parameter s. And I really want to spend a moment talking about s versus the, the j omega term that we had for the Fourier transform. First, we had this case of uh, j omega. So when we look at x j omega, this essentially tells us that if you have omega over here, uh, it's telling us the, the, the amount of energy for each of these uh, values of omega. So if there's something that looks like this, we can say this is how much energy it has. Uh, the amplitude tells us the amount of energy at each of these values of omega. That's what it can intuitively interpret it as. S is not a single quantity. It's not an omega. In fact, it's given by sigma plus j omega. So in fact, S exists on the plane. So we have sigma here, and on the complex axis, we have j omega here, as opposed to j omega over here and here being amplitude. So we have to 
look at the value, the Laplace transform for each point on the plane rather than each point on the axis. So in the case of the Fourier transform, we're looking at points on this axis over here, and that tells us the amplitude. In the case of the Laplace transform, we can think of it as being sort of three-dimensional. We have sigma and j omega. If you want to draw it differently, we have sigma here, we have j omega here, and on this value here is the value x of s which is the value of the Laplace transform over here. And we can see right away that the value xs is not going to be defined for certain values of sigma. If sigma is too small, then you're not going to get something that is going to be sufficiently small. So if you have, for example, this function x of t, which is rising exponentially fast, let's say e to the a t, this value had got to, has got to be larger. The value going to multiply it has going to be sigma is going to be greater than a, otherwise the product is not going to be small enough. We need to make sure sigma is greater than A. So over here, we can think of this value A over here, and xs is defined only for uh, the values that are to the right of this sigma greater than a, a sigma greater than A. So we call this over here the region of convergence. So the region of convergence is the set of values uh, of the value s. So it's the region of, uh, it's the set of values of s for which xs is defined. So xs is defined only in the region of convergence. And so part of the uh, transform is going to be not just telling us what the value is, but also what the region of convergence is. Okay, so the way we represent this as before is we say x of t, and the instead of the s, we put an l, the Laplace transform is going to be x of s. And uh, of course, it's a bidirectional transform, and the inverse transform is given by x of t is equal to 1 over 2 pi j integral sigma minus j infinity to sigma plus j infinity. I'll explain what that is in a moment. Xs e to the st ds. So if you look at this formula over here, what you're saying is that if you want to go from the xs, you're given xs, this one over here, and you want to find out what the corresponding xt is, we're going to compute the integral for uh, essentially going from the value of omega going from minus infinity to infinity at where sigma is fixed. So we fix sigma to a particular value. And it's sort of computing along this axis. So the if I go back to this figure over here, uh, we're going to keep sigma fixed and we're going to compute, we're going to move along the j omega axis, for example, over here. So this is the value sigma that you've chosen. This is sigma star. And you're going to compute the integral over here in this fashion, and that tells us how to compute xt. Uh, and the sigma that has been chosen has to be in the region of convergence. It can't be in the arbitrary region. Now, this is a fairly complex thing, and in fact, in practice, we never use the uh, Laplace. We never compute the Laplace transform using the inverse method. Instead, we use the properties of the Laplace transform, in particular duality, that we will uh, come to in a few minutes, in a few modules from now, uh, to compute the Laplace transform. 